There we go. It is time for us to begin our class this evening. Good to see uh, everyone here. We have a few of our number who are battling some sickness. Glad to see folks here that are able to get out. Um, I do want to pass along that Brother Richard Hill was able to go home to leave either month. He went home Saturday. And Sister Ann Pantel went home Monday, I believe. Either Monday or yesterday. I think it was Monday. And so thankful that both of them were able to be home. I know that's where they wanted to be. <clears throat> we are studying through the book of Job. I had, um, for some reason or the other, last week assumed that we would be able to cover two chapters and a half, and we got a half. So this evening, the goal will be to catch up with those two chapters. But let me tell you my plans going forward. We've gone through, after tonight, we will have gone through two speeches of each of the friends, two, two of the flies, obviously one of Job. So rather than go back through, this will be so far the last time, and we're not going to be in great detail with what he says. Uh, rather than go back through and hear Eliphaz and Bildad again, <clears throat> basically the same thing, for all practical purposes, they just kind of pile on a little bit, Bill, uh, Eliphaz especially. Uh, we are going to forego their speeches and Job's replies and move to to chapter 27. Not tonight, but we'll do 20 and 21 tonight. And in chapter 27, we have Job speaking of the portion of the wicked. And I want to deal with that chapter especially because I believe, uh, starting with verse 13, when he talks about the portion of the wicked, he has them in view of judgment, not their portion of the wicked here on earth. Now, we know far as we're talking about. Um, but I believe this is in view of them in final judgment, or at least after death. I think that, that might be a better way to look at it, after death. Um, chapter 28 is a chapter on wisdom. Chapter 29 is the Lord giveth, and so we have a picture of Job's life before he was destroyed. Chapter 30, the Lord taketh away, and so we'll have a picture of Job um, after he was destroyed at his present circumstances. And we won't be in great detail with those. Chapter 31 is Job's integrity. Uh, in essence, the Lord gives and the Lord taketh away, but I didn't deserve that. That's chapter 31. And then 32. That's what I'm, I'm rushing toward. We're, we're going to skip Elisha. Um... It's a bit different, his speech, with regards to how he speaks to Job. It comes across to me as if, as Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar charged Job with sin, therefore God has destroyed him. <clears throat> Elisha's discussion is almost as if, well, this has happened, and your reaction is not right. The way you're reacting to this is not right. Nevertheless, I want to move forward and come to chapter 38. 38, 39, 40, and 41. God speaking to Job. Then God backs up and gives Job opportunity, and Job says, no thank you. And then chapter 42, the final chapter. A lot of excellent thoughts and material. Now all of that with a very adventurous goal of completing by the end of the That's the goal. And then we'll see what we're doing after that. All right. With all of that being said, before we begin, I'm going to ask you to bow with me in prayer. Our God and our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and holy name. Father, we come before thee thankful for this hour, this time of opportunity to gather together to study from thy word opportunity to be with our Christian brothers and sisters, to be strengthened and to strengthen. Father, we 
pray for those of our number who are sick. We're thankful that Brother Richard Peel, Sister Ann Pantel have been able to return home. Father, we pray thy tender mercies upon them that they be with their family as they tend to their needs, that they also might be strengthened. Father, for others of our number who are sick, we pray that thou would be with them, the doctors and nurses that are tending to them, that they might provide those things needful, that they'll have that full measure of health return and they can be back with us again. For those who are traveling, Father, we pray special prayer for them, that they will be safe in their travel. Father, as we enter into our study, pray that we would empty our minds, that we would focus wholly on those things that thou hast revealed to us in this book, and that we would glean the lessons therefrom. And we pray in Jesus Christ, our Son's name. Amen. All right, Job chapter 20. So if you go for his second and final speech, he seems to run out of steam after this one. Then answered Zophar, no, this, is this Zophar? This is Zophar. Yeah, this is Zophar's second speech. Then answered Zophar the Namathite and said, Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer. He's very offended. He's very offended at some things that Job has said. Therefore do my thoughts cause me to answer, and for this I make haste. Uh, I'm going to hurry up and speak. I have heard the check of my reproach. I've heard you reproach me. Really, it was a friend's reproach. And the spirit of my understanding causeth me to answer. I, I, Job, you said that you know that, that uh, we're talking about you, but I know that you're, that you're speaking directly at me. Knowest thou, Job, do you, you ought to know better than to say the things you said. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumphant of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment? And we're not going to spend an immense amount of time, but let's just look back at Job's words in chapter 12 and verse 6. Job says, The tabernacles of the robbers prosper, and they that provoke God are secure, into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. Job, you said that God brings abundantly into the hands of the wicked. You said that they prosper. Uh, Job, you ought to know better than that. From the ancient times we see that any triumph of the wicked is short-lived. Verse 6. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach the clouds, he, he might just build himself up, way up, yet he shall perish forever like his own dung. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? He's here today and gone tomorrow. What happened to him? He shall fly away as a dream. Now here's, um, we're going to see dreams and visions and then we're going to see reality. He shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found. Yea, he shall be chased away as a vision of the night, the eye also which, which saw him shall see him no more, neither shall his place any more behold him. So as a dream uh, in our conscience is here and then gone. But then in reality, he will be gone. Now verse 10 is really striking. See, this wicked man, that's who Zophar is talking about. This man is, is a wicked man, verse 19. We're going to say he was a violent man and he took away things, all of his labor, Everything that he gained through his violent labor was fraudulent, dishonest, oppressive. And uh, now we're going to see what happens to him when he, or what happens to his children anyway. Verse 10, his children shall seek to please the poor. Well, those who were poor, did, you, did, this, did this go down? Did the volume go down on this mic or did it just me? His children shall seek to please the poor, and his hands shall restore their goods. The picture here is, the picture is, I don't know what's wrong. Let me try that one more time. The picture is, those who had, been, who had lost their possessions through the violent oppression and fraudulent means of this wicked man are going to get it back. And then the, the children of the wicked man will seek to please them because they will need patrons and supporters. That's the picture. His bones are full of the sin of his youth. That is, he's still full of vigor and youth. Which shall lie down with him in the dust. He'll be cut off in the prime of life. Though wickedness be sweet in his mouth, though it be hid under his tongue. You ever had something in your mouth 
and you uh, it's just so good you don't want to swallow it. Anything like that? I have one word. Bacon. Okay? Uh, you know, you can't get enough of it. You like popcorn. But notice verse 13. This is how wickedness is of this man. Verse 13, though he spare it. Spare, this term translated spare here, uh, carried with the idea of compassion. Uh, when you have compassion on a thing, you are willing to spare it. Though you need to get rid of it, though you need to remove it, you might show compassion. It's also carries the idea of desire. He desires it, therefore he's going to spare getting rid of it. Okay, He doesn't want to let it go. Though he spare it and forsake it not, but keep it still within his mouth, yet his meat, that food, that wickedness that he had in his mouth, in his bowels, once he swallows it down, is turned into the gall of ass within him. You ever eat something and you go, man, this is good. And after you eat it, a little bit later on, it didn't set well with you. That's the idea. Ask Fred about uh, getting a hold of some ghost peppers or getting those some ghost peppers. He has swallowed down riches and he shall vomit them up again. God shall cast them out of his belly. He shall suck the poison of ass and the viper's tongue shall slay him. He's pictured as nursing wicked, nursing on wickedness as, a, as an infant does its mother. Okay? He shall not see the rivers of flood, the brooks of honey and butter. What does that sound like? The brooks of honey and butter. What butter come from? Milk. Honey and milk. Brooks of honey and milk. A land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, he'll see the land of milk and honey, but he's not going to get to enjoy it. It's not for the wicked. That which he labored for, verse 18, drop down to 19. Because he hath oppressed and hath forsaken the poor, because he hath violently taken away an house which he builded not, that which he labored for by violent, oppressive, fraudulent, deceitful means, he shall restore. It's going back to others. We saw that in verse 10. And shall not swallow it down according to his substance, shall, he, shall the restitution be, and he shall not rejoice therein. Because, here's the reason, he's going to have to give that back up. Because, he was oppressive and violent. Verse 20. Surely he shall not feed or shall not feel quietness in his belly. He shall not save of that which he desired. There shall none of his meat be left. Therefore shall no man look for his goods. He's not content. He desires more and more his gain, but his gain perishes. He'll, he'll completely lose everything. He will be utterly consumed. In the fullness of his sufficiency, he shall be in straits. Whenever he's at the peak of his power, when he's at his zenith, that's when the difficulties will come. Sounds a lot like Job, doesn't it? Every hand of the wicked shall come upon him. What wickedness had not touched Job? And that would have been a blessing. Death would have been a blessing to Job. When he is about to fill his belly, when everything... Um, think about the people in, uh, we're not getting good sound down here. Think about the people of uh, Noah's day. What were they doing when the floods came? They were doing just like the other one. Okay. When he is about to fill his belly, God shall cast the fear of his wrath upon him, and it shall rain, uh, and shall rain it upon him while he is eating. It would be like every day. Think about uh, Daniel chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5 and Belshazzar having a party, feasting and eating, and what happened? And before the day was over with, he was gone. His kingdom was gone. God rained his wrath down on him. He shall flee from the iron weapon, and the bow of steel shall strike him through. It, it is drawn, the bow, and cometh out of the body, yea, the glittering sword or the sword perhaps drawn, cometh out of his gall, terrors are upon him. All darkness shall be hid in his secret places. Somebody read that in another translation at the beginning of verse 26. Okay, secret places, his treasures, things hid. Uh, it's, they're all going to be gone. A fire not blown shall consume him. What's a fire not blown? 
unfaithful. It doesn't need any help. It doesn't need any help. This may be a fire of his own making. Fire not blown shall consume him. It shall go ill with him that is left in his house, in his tabernacle. All those that remain, it's not going well with them. The heavens shall reveal his iniquity, and the earth shall rise up against him. Job, heaven has revealed your iniquity. And everything upon this earth has come up against you. The increase of his house shall depart, and his goods shall flow away in the day of his God's wrath. <clears throat> Have you ever seen um, videos of a tsunami? That Remember, was it in Indonesia when that tsunami came in? And you saw people in some elevated places but all of their, their houses, it would just it would hit the houses, it would hit the buildings, it would just tear them down, just flow away. What could they do to stop that? What could they do to save some of their possessions from flowing away? Nothing. His good shall flow away in the day of God's wrath. There's nothing he'll be able to do. This is the portion of a wicked man from God and the heritage appointed unto him by God. Job, you said that, that uh, the wicked man uh, do not perish. Well, Job didn't say that completely. He just says, uh, sometimes they die. Now, chapter 21. I want us to notice here Job's reply. Uh, starting with verse 7, especially, we're going to see Job says, the wicked do prosper. They do prosper so far. We get down to verse 17. The wicked do not always seek. If you don't believe me, ask the travelers who go all over the place and ask them what they say. They'll tell you about it. All right, let's look at any before we move on. Any any questions, comments, and thoughts? Okay. First one. But Job answered and said, "Hear diligently my speech, and let this be your consolation." Consolation. What's consolation? Comfort. Um, you boys be quiet, and that's the best way you can comfort me. Just let me talk. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken. Mock on. Just back up. Be quiet. Let me talk, and after that I'll be quiet. And then you can go ahead and mock me some more. As for me, my complaint, or is my complaint to man? Am I complaining to men? I'm not complaining to men about. You ever had somebody come to you and complain about somebody else? And you're thinking, what are you thinking to yourself? Don't tell me, go tell them. Right? You need to go talk to them about this. Job says, as for me, is my complaint to man? And if it were so, why should not my spirit be troubled? He's not complaining about God to man. He is coming to God with his complaint. And how often have we seen Job He's talking in defense of himself, but then turn and speak to God. Mark me. Look at me. And be astonished and lay your hand upon your mind. What should happen is what happened to you when you first came upon me, end of Job chapter 2, and you saw me and you, you wailed and cried when you saw my grief. And you should look at me and you should be astonished and you should just cover your mouth. That's what you should do. But that's not what you're doing. Verse 6, Even when I remember, I'm afraid. Whenever I stop, you ever be in a bad situation and then stop and think about it? And just realize, or maybe have gone through a difficult time and then after a while, think back about it and you just go, oh. So he said, even when I remember, when I think back. Now this indicates to me that it's been a while this has been going on. Months. I am afraid and trembling take up hold of my flesh. But my friend, what do they do? Go back up to verse 2. They mock. They scorn. They rebuke. They falsely charge. All right. Job is going to set the record straight with regards to the wicked. So far, I know the wicked will come to an end. I know the wicked do sometimes come to an end, but they don't always come to an end immediately, like you say. They're not here today, gone tomorrow. Sometimes they do not suffer. The wicked do prosper. Verses 7 through 16. 
Wherefore do the wicked live and become old? Why do, why do the wicked live and become old, Joe Far? Do you know any anybody that's old that's, that's lived a wicked life? Uh, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Now, verses 9, 10, and 11, we're going to note their, or rather verses 7 through 11, the emphasis here is their prosperity. They get older. Uh, their family grows. They increase. Verse 9, their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Go talk to uh, those men who came and, and killed my servants and took my property so far. Go into their house and see if they're suffering the way I am. Go look at their children and see how they're enjoying their children and their grandchildren. And you tell me that the wicked always suffer. They never prosper and they never continue. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Now it is from time to time. But it's not always. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They prosper. They send forth their little ones like a flock and their children dance. They enjoy their children. They enjoy their grandchildren. They see their birthdays. They celebrate with them. Don't tell me that the wicked do not prosper. Don't tell me that the wicked do not enjoy life. They do. Verses 12 and 13, they also enjoy peace. They take the timbrel and the harp and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down in the grave. I wish I could go down in the grave in a moment instead of having to suffer for months and months after having buried my children and lost my, all the possessions that I have. I wish I could go down in just a moment. What a blessing it would be and uh, in the, toward the end of your life, having seen your children grown and your grandchildren grown and enjoying life in peace, to quickly be taken. I wish I could enjoy something like that. I don't have peace like the wicked do so far. Verses 14 through 16. Therefore they say unto God. Here's what the wicked man says to God. Now what had Satan said Job. God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. What was Satan's reply? Well, the only reason he has anything to do with you is because you give him everything. Now watch it. Therefore they, the wicked, say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy way. We don't have any need for you, mess. We've got everything we want. We've got everything we need, and we've got it with our own hands and our own ingenuity and our own mind and our own intellect. You haven't given us anything. What have you given us to cause us to worship you? To be loyal to you? Now that's what Satan chose. Now there are some men who live that way. Job wasn't one of them. Job had great possessions. But what did Job know? Those possessions came from God. How, how do we know that he believed that? How does chapter 1 end? The Lord gave. The Lord gave. Everything I had, the Lord gave. Everything I had was the Lord to begin with. He just put that into my trust. And if He wants to take it away from me, He can. Now, he didn't have a full understanding of all that had taken place. But you see His attitude. The wicked man's not like that. The wicked man tells God, leave us alone. Go away from us. What have you given us that we should even have any desire for you? Verse 15. What is the Almighty that we should serve Him? That's what the wicked man says. And what profit should we have if we pray unto Him? If I take time and pray to Him, what's He going to give me? What do I get out of this? Lo, now verse 6, I love this. Lo, their good is not in their hands. Uh, they did not come by that by their own ingenuity. By their own intellect. Those are blessings of God. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's the picture we have here of the wicked. Job said. Now, 
But he says they, they still prosper. They still live in peace. Even though this is their, their attitude, their philosophy. Lo, their good is not in their hand. They don't know that the Lord gave. And look at verse 30, at the end of verse 16. The counsel of the wicked is far from them. I can't wrap my mind around that type of counsel. They say, why would we serve God? He hasn't done anything for us. And if we did serve Him and pray to Him, what could He give us that we don't already have? They don't know what they have was not of their own doing. God gave that to them. And then you're going to see Job just kind of sit back and say, I, I, I don't understand how people can think like that. Verses 17 through 26. The wicked do not always see calamity. Yeah, they do sometimes, but not all the time. And the righteous sometimes see calamity. Eliphaz built out in Zophar, but not always. All right. How oft is the candle of the wicked put out? And how oft is their destruction upon them? How often have you seen the candle of the wicked? What happens whenever uh, a candle is put out? Yeah, the light's gone. Their life is gone. And how oft their destruction upon them? Uh, that, you could put here that, God distributed sorrow in His anger. How often have you seen God distribute sorrow in His anger to the wicked and their candle put out and they be totally destroyed? Y'all be honest with me. How often have you seen that? Do you not know people that are living that are wicked, but they just they live seem to live in peace? I wish I had thought of this. There is a particular psalm where David is discussing this. Uh, where he, he's wondering, why do the wicked prosper? and Why do they not suffer like I am? And he ultimately realizes it'll all come to an end for them. They're not the children of God. Okay, let me see. Well, I turned to 66. Let me check 73. Let me check 37. I don't see either one of them exactly what I was looking for at the beginning, but one of the Psalms, David is speaking in such a similar fashion, asking why they do not suffer. But he, he comes to the realization they do. They will. So how oft is the candle of the wicked put out? And how oft cometh their destruction upon them that God distributes his sorrows, uh, distributes sorrows to the wicked in anger, in his anger. Verse 18, they are, or so that they, the wicked, are as stubble before the wind. What happens whenever the wind blows and the stubble's laying there on the ground? And you take the stubble and throw it up in there and the wind blows. Blows away. How often have you seen that? And the chaff that the storm carried. How often have you seen the wicked be completely destroyed by God like I have been so that they are just like the, the chaff blown into the wind? You fellas, be, be honest and tell me. What Job is asking me? God layeth up His iniquity for His children. That is, for the wicked man. He rewardeth him and he shall... No, yet. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 11. <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 11. The old lion perisheth. Here you see every stage of, of a lion when you go back into verse 10. Let's look at 10 and 11. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion perisheth. They lack of prey. The stout lions wept or scattered abroad. Um, chapter 5 and verse 4. His children are free or far from safety uh, and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them. They save the wicked. God layeth up His iniquity uh, for His children. He rewardeth him and he shall know it. His eyes shall see His destruction and He shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what pleasure hath He uh, this is the wicked here being unconcerned. What pleasure. The children of the wicked are going to suffer. Uh, consequences. Look at verse 21. For what pleasure hath he in his house after him when the number of his mouths, the number of his months, has cut off in the midst? Have you ever known someone with such a character that as long as everything was good with them, if their family suffered, it's okay? 
And the wicked doesn't care about it. His children are going to suffer. The consequences of his life, he's okay with that. He's okay with that. He has no pl- What pleasure hath he in his house? Man. Shall any teach God knowledge, seeing he judges those that are high? One dieth now. Um, we'll have here a general picture of all of humanity here, starting with verse 23. One dieth in his full strength, being holy at ease and quiet. His beasts are full of milk, and his bones are moistened with marrow. And another die in the bitterness of his soul, and never eateth uh, with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust, and the worm shall cover them. Death is a great equalizer. Some that are righteous will uh, die in full strength, and others will die in bitterness of soul. Some of the wicked will die in full strength, and some in the bitterness of soul. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The point Job is making here, his friends were saying all suffering is because of one's own sin. Job says no. All wicked men perish greatly. You'll never see them prosper, uh, not for any length of time. Job says yes, sometimes they live very long age, and they live and prosper, and they live in peace, and suddenly they die. It is not a long, drawn-out process of suffering for them. But the, the, it may be so for the righteous also. Matthew, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You know, if I were to go next week to the doctor, and the doctor said, Mr. Scherfus, you should get your house done. You will die in my what King Hezekiah was told. I uh, have some type of a disease, cancer or something like that. Um, would I be able to say, woe is me, I'm the only one who's ever gotten this healed? Job's saying, look, the, the righteous or the wicked do sometimes suffer, but not always the way you men are painting this. Behold, I know your thoughts. Now here, I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself in chapter Job now says, you know, I've been listening to you fellas for a while, and y'all must think I, I don't have a lot of sense because you've been wording things very generally. Uh, you've been kind of pointing your finger at me, but whenever I look at you, you know. You ever, you ever turned and looked at somebody, and you know they were looking at you, but just as soon as you looked at it, kind of their eyes move or they kind of turn. He goes, I know you've been talking about me. I know you've been pointing your finger at me. You act like you're not, but I know you are. Verse 27, Behold, I know your thoughts and the devices which you wrongfully imagine against me. I know you've been talking about me. For you say, where is the house of the prince? I know you've been talking about me. And where are the dwelling places of the wicked? You talk about the wicked. You talk in generalities. You're talking about me. Have you not asked them that go by the way? Here we go. Who are those that go by the way? Isaiah refers to this one as the wayfaring man. The wayfaring man. The man that fares by the way. The man that goes along the way. The man that travels. Ask the man that goes by the way. Ask the man that travels. You men telling me that the wicked uh, do not last, but only those that are prospering are righteous. You ask the men that travel from place to place and they've been north, south, east, and west and ask them what they've seen. Ask them that go by the way and do you not know their tokens? The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. Anybody have that worded differently? Verse 30. Okay, the whole that whole opening line. Okay, the wicked are reserved. Anybody have anything other than re- reserved? Yeah. So when you read it that way, reserved, it, it almost looks like Job is saying, uh, they may prosper, but God has reserved them for death, for, for destruction, for judgment. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, ask the men who travel from place to place and ask them what he sees of the wicked. What he sees is the wicked is reserved. That is, the wicked are spared. That's the meaning. The 
The wicked are spared in the day of destruction, in the day of calamity. They haven't seen the wicked men suffer, as you say all the time. They shall be brought forth uh, to the day of wrath. That is, they'll be led away from the day of wrath. Have you ever seen anybody led away from destruction? What about Lot? Now, he was a righteous man. And that's the picture he's painting here. Whenever there's a trick, he's spared. He's kind of taken out of that. That's what this, that, and he said, that's not me talking. That's people that's been traveling around. He asked them, who shall declare his way to his face? Who is bold enough to go to the wicked man, this man of violence and oppression you're talking about so far, and get in his face and tell it like it is? No man is bold enough to do that. They cower under him. Who's bold enough to do that? And who shall repay him what he hath done? No one is so bold to do that. Yet shall he be brought to the grave. When he dies, they'll carry him to the grave in great procession. They'll honor him in life. They'll fear him in life. They'll honor him in death. Not only that, and shall remain in the tomb. They'll guard his tomb. They'll show him great honor, even in death. The clods of the valley shall be sweet unto him, and every man shall draw after him. After him, and there are innum- as there are innumerable before him. Well, all will die. All have to. How then comfort ye me in vain? Well, we go quickly. Chapter sixteen and verse two. I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. How then comfort ye me in vain? You came to comfort me, but if you, you failed. You've fallen short. Seeing in your answers, seeing in your speeches, there remaineth falsehood. In other words, the words, their words were self-contradictory. Their words were easily proven false. You men yourselves look around and see if what you see in this life is equal to what you are saying. Ask those men who have traveled the world if they have seen what you see. And they'll tell you what you're saying is not true. How are you comforting me with words that are demonstrably untrue and false? What failures you are comforting? Now, Job again, hear diligently my speech and let this be your consolation. In other words, be quiet, let me speak. Suffer me that I may speak, and after that I have spoken mock on. Well, Eliphaz is going to take him up on that in chapter 22. We're not going to get deeply into it. I've got maybe two minutes, so I'm going to read a little bit. Look at verse 2 of chapter 22. Can a man be profitable unto God, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is any is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Is it is, does God have any joy that man is righteous? Certainly he does. Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will 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 uh, God withhold because he's afraid of you? Will he enter with thee into judgment? Is not now look at this? Is not thy wickedness great and thine iniquities infinite? Job, you have your it's such a list of, of sin for you, I can't even talk about all of it. For thou hast taken a pledge from thy brother for naught and stripped the, the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink. Thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. But for the mighty man, that's you, Job, the mighty violent man, he had the earth and the honorable man dwelt in it. Thou hast sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless have been broken. Well, Job said earlier, don't speak in generalities, speak straight. Job said, let me just talk now, and after that, you can mock on again. So Eliphaz takes him up on it. Well, we'll um, we'll come back next week. We'll pick up in uh, chapter 27. And we're going to see uh, Job speaks concerning the poor. No, we'll pick up in, uh, yes, chapter 27. The Lord gives. I uh, will see. Um, and the Lord has taken. 29. I'll get it right. 
We'll pick up chapter 29. Right, good evening, brethren. Our song before uh, tonight's devotional will be uh, number 632, The Gospel is for All. Again, our, our song before the devotional is number 632. The gospel is for all. All three verses. <coughs> also, the song that we will be singing uh, after the devotional will be number 215. Hear me when I call. We'll be singing that after the devotional. You can go ahead and mark it at this time. <coughs> Uh, 
Of one the Lord has made the race, to one has come the fall. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Say not the heathen are at home, beyond we have no call. For why should we be blessed alone, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Receive ye freely, freely give, from every land they call. Unless they hear, they cannot live, the gospel is for all. The blessed gospel is for all, the gospel is for all. Where sin has gone must go his grace, the gospel is for all. Whenever people travel and have children with them, the kids want to know, are we there yet? Uh, it's natural to want to get through ordeals. And so whenever kids are in school, we'll be so glad when I get through high school and graduate, go to college. What a grueling experience to try to get through all those courses. You want to get that degree and just keep hanging on. Um, in the realm of faith, I believe that people are also sometimes impatient. We tend to be that way as humans. And as I think about how God has dealt with humans over history, it seemed like there was a slow, slow growth period. In my figure, I'll use the infantile stage, the adolescent stage, and then the mature stage or adulthood. Get this from Galatians 3, verse 24, where it speaks of the law being a tutor to bring us to Christ. And that word has to do with a slave who dealt with youngsters and made sure they got to school, got behind them and whipped on them, whatever it took to get them to school. That's what the old law was like, dealing with youngsters. So there are people in the Old Testament lauded for their faith like Abraham. He saw the promised land of Canaan, a view of it, but he did not possess it. God told him his descendants would get to enter about 430 years later. That in Galatians 3 verse 17. So the patriarchs sought more. Abraham, that is the patriarch, Abraham sought more. He looked for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Something beyond that promised land. Hebrews 11, verse 10. So even getting the land of Canaan was not the ultimate. Humans were not there yet, so to speak. Esau failed to perceive the value he had in that birthright, so he sold it for a mess of lentil beans. The Bible calls him a profane man, Hebrews 12, verse 17. He was material-minded and short-sighted, not seeing what lay ahead. He did not perceive spiritual things. The Israelites' failure to recognize the wonderful promised land was right there in front of them for the taking, Grumble, wanted to go back to Egypt, didn't think they would get in, so that older generation died off. They were short-sighted, not perceiving what the Mosaic physical ordinances foretold them. They didn't even see the patterns that were in part of the law of Moses. 
Now the Israelites, they got tired of God serving, uh, serving God just simply as their king, and they wanted to have a physical, a physical king like the nations around them. All right, you remember that. And so God told them what those kings would do. They were short-sighted, wanted a king anyway. They did not perceive what Moses' physical ordinances were foretelling. And so they failed to honor God properly and did not see what kings were going to be like, even though God told them. Now, that's enough of that. We come to the period of the prophets. And the prophets then were given visions by God about the eternal kingdom coming, a king that uh, would rule forever. But they were not there yet. They wanted to see more, but they weren't there yet, having possessed it. But the book of Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son to the earth. Now, angels announced his coming. The shepherds knew of it. The elderly people in the temple were waiting for Messiah, and they recognized him as a youngster. John the baptizer pointed him out. The miraculous works that Jesus did pointed him out. But the Jewish leaders failed to see who was right in front of them and recognize him as their real Messiah. And so, of course, they crucified him. So what's the problem? Humans' failure to recognize wonderful blessings that we currently have and what is right in front of us. Now, Hebrews 12 is really where my text thought comes from, over in verse 22 and 3 especially. Are we there yet? Yet, And the writer says, you are come unto. That's the lead. You are come unto. What have we come to? Well, in the writing, he's trying to pull them away from going back into Judaism. He wants them to recognize where they have been brought by God. You are come to Mount Zion. Well, Zion, what's that? Zion is the place, of course, where the temple was. It's the place where uh, the Ark of the Covenant was. It's the stronghold that David took over. So it was really the dwelling place of God, where God's name was to be placed, the seat of his kingdom. So getting back uh, away from the old figures, it amounts to this. Where have Christians come to? The seat of government of God, the kingdom of God, the place where God dwells. And so Philippians 3 verse 20 says, we, our citizenship is in heaven. We are residents who shall dwell not on a dirt mountain, but in the true city of God. Second, he says you come to a host of angels. Well, we read in other places in the Bible about myriads of myriads or millions of millions of angels. Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. But in this very book, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, speaks about those angels. The angels in the one figure are standing around the throne of God at the ready. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, Angels are ministering spirits sent forth to do service for those who will be heirs of salvation. Where have we come to? The blessing of the host of angels attending us. Do we realize that? We have come, he says next, to the general assembly and the church of firstborn ones whose names are enrolled in heaven. People seated here tonight just look like regular folks, but we are called saints. We are citizens of heaven. We are God's chosen people, firstborn ones, joint heirs with Christ, the firstborn. Recognize who we are. And we have come to God, the judge of all, the text says in Hebrews 12. 
Well, this is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. The Lord, the righteous judge, will award us the crown of life. Instead of the fearful figure, the righteous judge will give us the crown of life. We have come to the spirits of men made perfect. Now that's a strange figure. But he just talked in chapter 11 about the heroes of faith. And at the end of chapter 11, he has this interesting comment. God, having provided some better thing concerning us, that apart from us, they, those heroes of faith, should not be made perfect. So we are grouped in with the heroes. We are grouped in with the people like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David, the prophets like Daniel, or even Paul and Silas, Timothy, Dorcas, Mary, Phoebe, others. We are part of that group. He wants us to realize that. That's what we have come to. And we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Now, Jesus is the one who, between God and man, he's brought us this new covenant where all the blessings lie. They're not in the old, but in the new, the Hebrew writer wants the people to know. So those famed world religions out there who have ditched Jesus have got rid of the mediator. They do not have the one who has brought us where we can then be reconciled to God. And people then who think they're going to be able to stand before God on their own righteousness, they need to read from Isaiah. Over there in chapter 64, verse 6, that the righteousness of humans is as filthy rags, I think the old version puts it, defiled garment in the eyes of God. But what do Christians have? Paul put it this way in Philippians chapter 3. He rejected the righteousness which was his own by the law in favor of the righteousness which is through faith in Jesus. And so, what are we going to get? Hebrews says this, but also look at Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. We will be adorned in pure white robes made holy by the blood of the Lamb. What have we come to? These are the things the writer wants us to know. And the final one in the little list, the sprinkled blood that's better than Abel's. Now you might wonder if it's the blood of Abel that cried from the ground, or if it's the blood sacrifice that Abel offered, which was approved of God. Let's take it the latter, latter one for the moment. Since God respected Abel's sacrificial lamb blood, how much more he will accept the blood of the true lamb of God, Jesus. Who will God accept? Christians. These are the things we have brought, been brought to in the new covenant. If you are a Christian, those are things that you enjoy or they're right there in front of you. Recognize then in final thought, the wonderful blessings you currently have and those that are right at hand. As Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 puts it, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hang on. If this evening you need to come to the front for prayers and become a Christian, you have a song selected, let's stand and sing. Hear me when I call, O oh God, my righteousness, unto Thee I come in weakness and distress. Oh, my trembling hand, lest helpless I Oh, hear me, Lord, hear me, oh, hear me.
together in prayer. Um, please remember those listed in the Midtown Messenger for a complete list of those in need of your prayers. Uh, Peggy Matlock's son, um, he is in the ER with a possible pneumonia, so please be mindful uh, of him. There are sign-up sheets for hosting youth devotionals, preparing communion, and opening and closing the building for this year. Uh, it is on the bulletin board in the hallway, so if you can volunteer for that, please sign up. Midtown will be hosting our Ladies' Day on Saturday, February the 5th. The speaker is Lakeisha Garza, and lunch will be provided. Registration begins at 8.30 a.m. Uh, our next service will be this Sunday at 9 a.m. for our Bible study, and 10 o'clock following for our worship service. So join me, we'll close together in prayer. Our Holy Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time. Father, so thankful for... The opportunity we have midweek to assemble together, Father, to hear uh, these lessons from your word. We pray that during this hour of study, we have been attentive, Father. We have learned more from your word, Father. Uh, we thank you so much for the teachers of the congregation and their willingness to teach your word, Father, and the preparation that goes into preparing these lessons. Father, we thank you so much for our eldership. We pray for your blessings upon them and their family as they Neighbor with us, Father, and we pray that as a congregation we make their, their burden light. Father, we pray that you be with us through the remainder of this week until we meet again. We thank you so much for Christ, for his sacrifice, for his teaching, for his example, and we pray that you forgive us whenever we sin and fall short of the mark. We love you and love Christ, and all these things we pray in his holy name. Amen.